Okay, thank you very much for part of this one. You make very clear about the uh, about the social teaching of the church concerning on uh, migration. So I think it is quite I would like to uh, convey something according to the local situation and tourism. I think in Thailand also we have in the Asian country, especially the Southeast Asian country. For example, in Thailand we have situated almost at the central part of uh, other countries too. Because in the, in the west, there is Burma, in the, in the north, China, in the east, Cambodia, Laos, the south, Malaysia. So, now because of the, not a big problem is the construction of the dams along Gulf River, Salween River in the, in the west, in the west side of Thailand, and also in the uh, east of Thailand, there is a Mekong River. So both river, the uh, water dam construction. And then the dam site, uh, because of the, the flood, the water flood, the most of the community are under water. And the villages, other farmland, and other water, so people have to move out. So now the migration workers, especially from Myanmar and Burma. And a great number entered in Thailand. And but I think in the in Canada last year the number is less the, the, the most uh, the, the big guest number from Myanmar. Uh, the reason I think there are many reasons. One reason is the political reason. Around 150,000 uh, people because of the political reasons. So they are now uh, confined in what we call a refugee camp. So now there are nine camps in, in along the Thai Burman border. There are 150 refugees there. So that's only in the camps. But outside the camps, I think more than, I think more than two or three million. But the legal workers around maybe or 20 or 25 percent. The rest are illegal workers. So, so that is the problem now, hopefully in Thailand. And then, and not only that, and they're starting on, because of most of the, the migrant workers, the women, because the woman is the one who is responsible for the uh, income on the family, so they are moving to Thailand. And there are many, many, uh, many events happens. I think last, uh, last four years ago, there are workers from Burma, they are put in the container, in the, the truck container, around 120 workers. And then the driver, because of their illegal workers, and then the driver drive. And because of far distance, around 100 kilometers from the border to the city, they want to escape from the police, so they put in the container. And during the way, the, the function doesn't work. The air condition, the fissure doesn't work. So all people are around, almost 60 people, die in the container, and then most of them are women. But this is a very serious problem. And then I think uh, also to this uh, migrant worker are vulnerable to become the human trafficking. So I think this is the situation in, in Thailand, or in other neighboring country. I think maybe Father Ipot will share more of this. So, Bob, morning we have a number of questions we raised, and we conclude a morning session by lunch, you know, and reflecting on theological reflection, what it means during theology, 
Okay, now after this input on migrants, you have to do theological reflection. And, um, uh, and there are certain important uh, theological or faith parameters to reflect on this. And a simple, uh, they are all mostly um, important uh, theological or symbolic phrases which Father Desmond referred to. A simple thing in terms of the people of Israel, in terms of the cheap migrants, widows, orphans, and the aliens called also migrants. Then uh, the story continues coming to you in Jesus himself as a migrant in various senses and so on. Of your birth, escape from Herod, all those things. And uh, all along Jesus in his own ministry give importance to the people who are kept outside the society and so, so forth. Uh, all these become for us indicator of God's way of dealing with his people. God's way of dealing with his people. I always mention the story with regard to Luke chapter 15, which gives the three famous parables. One parable all of you will know, the parable of the prodigal son. Even that is a wrong name, not a prodigal son, we say prodigal son's father. Even that is not good enough. If I am going for it, you should be renamed as a prodigal. It is the parable of the son lost and found. That is the new way of naming the parable. At the beginning of that, there is two verses. Tax collectors, prostitutes, lepers, people are left out of society, are flocking together, drawing near to Jesus to listen to him. For he has brought the good news for them. At the time, the Pharisees and scribes, the leaders, grumbled, just scandalized. They say, this man welcomes the sinners. That's already a bad point for them. Still worse, he eats with them also. Table fellowship, still worse. Now, they are referring to two actions of Jesus. He welcomes them, still worse, he eats with them. Keeping ten fellowship only with people we know well, we'll uh, eat with them in the family. And for them it's a scandal. But for us, for the faith, for the those people who are drawing near to Jesus, these very sad scandal actions for the Pharisees and so on are indeed a revelation of how God deals with these people. He is the one who welcomes them. He is the one who sits, keeps table fellowship with them. And Jesus is the revelation of God's love and compassion and so on. So that is the way we are getting a certain theological parameters to reflect on this great issue, not only the other issues of marginalization, how do we respond? God's paradigm, His way of dealing with His people. And this morning I said that the Bible reveals to us, provide through the re-reading, reinterpretation you discover, the paradigm means the basic model of God's response to human situation, of God's relatedness to our human situation. And in the, the, the story of the Exodus, where thousands of Israel are working as slaves, all of you must have seen the film, The Ten Commandments, and so on. They show how they suffer, get oppressed. And, uh, <clears throat> and here they are slaves, and God intervenes there as he morning, said this morning, and he said, I have heard their cries and agonies, how the taskmasters of Egypt deal with my people. I have come to liberate them and calls Moses to be servant to liberate and so on. Now, in this situation of oppression, they are treated as slaves. And therefore, it is an oppression. Oppression of whom? Oppression of human persons, like you and me, human people, whole community, the whole community of people, therefore, are treated as, as, as slaves, as source of cheap labor, who guarantee the pharaohs of Egypt to build their buildings, whatever it is, and so on. And therefore, this oppression of people, we call it, if you want to name it, give you a correct name, it's a human oppression. Nowhere Human beings can be exploited, treated as slaves, 
treated as source of cheap labor, treated as a thing, as a means. God's will is absolutely clear. So he comes there to liberate them. His action response is to liberate. There's no other way. Okay, you people, I am with you. Suffer tomorrow. You will you know, you'll reap benefit of joy, etc. tomorrow and so on. No, he says, my people have to be a people. Liberate them. Now come to contemporary society. We saw this, what mass and luxury tourism does to people of when they are victims. And in India we have one, uh, I always give this example. We have uh, among laborers, there is a group of laborers known as bonded laborers. Bonded laborers means people go there, they are very poor, no job. Some big contractors, landlords, estate owners, employ them. But make them work day and night. For, of course they give them food, a small place to live. Otherwise they were on the street without jobs, almost like beggars. At least these people give a place to uh, live and they are guaranteed their meals and so on. But in course of time, you begin to see how they operate. They exploit them. No eight hours work. They will work the whole day. No time, no time for holiday. No uh, once a week holiday, nothing. The children cannot go to school. And they give them, lend them money. For example, the child is very sick. You have to take the hospital, otherwise the child will die. The landlord will give money. And money, say, thousand rupees may give. So they say, let's say, hundred dollars he gives. And they have to sign. These people are illiterate people. They cannot sign, they cannot read. They can put only the fingerprint. Fingerprint. Illiterate people will put the fingerprint. But he will write, though they have written, given only hundred dollars or fifty dollars, you write as if they received for this some five hundred dollars. Not only that, there will be an interest attached to you. Interest also will be attached to you. And they have been working. They will like that multiply. They will say, for the money I have lent and the interest you have to pay, you have to always be working. And therefore, this is called bonded labor. This is called slavish labor. That is the title given. And it is slave labor. Now, you want a number of people work for the liberation of bonded laborers. We have a NGOs, committed people to work for them, study them. We have one famous uh, uh, Hindu Swami, who became a great activist, you must have heard about him, Swami Agnivesh. Swami Agnivesh is the one who started the whole movement working for liberation of bonded laborers in India. And he comes in for your papers, other meetings, somebody is invited for intelligence uh, action and so on. And uh, now, for bonded laborers, what will be a word of God for them? For people in, Egypt, in Egypt, the word of God came as a word of liberation. It did not come as any other word. In a situation of oppression, in a situation of oppression, God's word comes only as a word of liberation. Not always comfort, consolation and so on. For bonded laborers who are in a similar situation of oppression. Bonded laborers is slavery, oppression. It's also human oppression, like the other woman. Of course, there is huge oppression. Yet the number may be small, maybe 200 people, 300 people. Then there may be 200,000 or 500,000 people. But both oppressions, human oppression. Here also the word of God will come only as a word of liberation. We cannot go tell, plead with the landlord, please give them holiday. Do not oppress too much. Give little petrol for That's not liberation. Till they are under the control of the world. The very, to give them dignity, they should be liberated from such a situation so that they can earn as their own with the justice, dignity and the children also grow. So a number of groups work for them and they do succeed. And, uh, and then what I want to say is, in a situation of operation, God's word comes only as a word of liberation. Tomorrow people are dying of because fiery serpents. Remember, Israel were complaining to God and there was a fiery serpent, they were dying. They were going to cry to Moses, we have sinned and so on. He goes and cries and so on. At the time, they want to live. So, Moses is told to raise his uh, serpent like metal figure and they will see himself alive. What I want to say, in a situation of death, the word of God will come only as a word of life. 
In a situation, people are uprooted, they are exiles. In Babylonian exile or other exiles. And they even complain, no? They are even, there's a beautiful story in the Bible. I even never read that. The, they are, uh, musical instruments are all similarly lying in the exiled country. When they were in back, you know, back home, though, before the exile, they would sing psalms and so on, instruments, drums. Now all those instruments are simply hanging without an idol and so on. How can we sing our song near land? We are uprooted and so on. So on. That people say that. So what they were longing? They, people in exile want to return home. When are we going back? The word of the prophet comes, he will go home. You are building a temple and so on. So when you party, people are exiled, what will be the good news of God? Will it better the conditions, little better? No. For them who have been uprooted, for uprooted people, something like this. <coughs> of course, this is a different migrant, a different story. But for these people, the word of God is will come that you will return home. You live in your own land. Build your culture, your own vineyards. Build your own temple and houses and so on and so forth. That is the way. And you will find this kind of consistent message. For this, the word of God will come, you will return home. Not the other word. And people are always working as slaves for others. And the promise in Isaiah we get in. Tomorrow you will go home. You will, so far you are cultivating land for others. You will not reap the fruit. You will build the buildings for others. You will not be able to live. Now you will go home, you will cultivate a vineyard where you will bring your own wine and whatever it is. Similarly, you build your own son. That kind of theme continues, including the New Testament. Now coming to the New Testament, famous text, all of you are familiar with. Jesus before beginning his mission in Luke chapter 4, 16-20. They want me to know. One day I went to the synagogue in Nazareth and he used to go there and, uh, on the Sabbath day and that day the Rabbi asked him, where don't you read? He goes and t- read text from prophet, prophet Isaiah, chapter 61 and uh, 58 and so on. Then he said, no, the spirit of the Lord has anointed me, proclaim the good news to the poor. The blind will see. What will be good news for the blind? He will give you a better bail system. He will give you a better walking stick. The, for the blind man, what will be real liberation? That he can see. A lame man, the lame will walk. What will be the good news for the lame? To walk. Walk, not better support. Crutches. You will be able to walk. That's why the paral- paral- paralysis fellow comes there. They bring him on a stretcher. Your sins are forgiven. People are grumbling. How can he forgive his sins? You are questioning whether he can forgive sins and so on. Then your Lord says, which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven? Or I will tell the fellow, take up your bed and go walk. Paralytic. Both can come only from God as word of liberation. And therefore, they, now he tells them, man, get get up, take your bed and go home. Fellow jumps to his feet and goes home. And it's consistent everywhere. There is here, this is consistency of the divine word coming to human situation always in this way. And you discover this pattern of God's response. This is what we are supposed to embody, the mission of the church in our thing. The God's way of responding to the human situation. People are burdened with the guilt now coming to a little more moral situation. Burdened with guilt, sin and so on. What will the word of God? It will come as a word of forgiveness. You are accepted, come back. You are accepted, you are my people. The prodigal son when he returns, he came with a formula of Confession, no? He came with a formula confession. I'll tell him, of course, I squandered all my father. I am unworthy of my father to be his son. I'll go and tell him, I'll, I have sinned against heaven and the earth. And, law, I am unworthy to be a servant. Accept me as your servant. That's the formula <coughs> to which he comes. But every day, the father was looking for his son to return. When he comes, he starts his formula, doesn't even come to him. And finally, he gives him the. So, what I want, my main point is, we to discover the model of God's response to us. There is a consistent divine pattern of response in the Bible, which you discover through correct rereading, through reinterpretation. 
And that quality of response, we have to learn in our mission of the church. That's what we wanted to tell you. Okay? Good. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Now I think the Father is on the page. Just uh, keep some experience how, when the migrants come in, how are we going to work? Because uh, solicitor, lay socialist, no? that one there. One, uh, 1989, uh, uh, talk about solidarity, how to build up the network organizations of uh, John Paul II, because of his experience of Poland, the solidarity group. No? So his idea of development that you have to organize people in order to empower the people in their own, not the church, must not do it for the people, but they have to be with the people. And that's very important about empowerment in the solidarity. The church has to be so in solidarity with the people in order to transform that structural sin or system of the society. So I think this is very important. No? Now, um, I have two, three things just really short. The situation now, contemporary situation in that uh, GMS, no? uh, Greater Mekong sub-regional, China, Burma, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, uh, and Vietnam. It affects a lot, as uh, Dr. Sun Thon said. So, so a lot of people come to Thailand. Uh, I asked the official, said, this is not three million now, it is six million. Uh, who have migrated into Thailand so fast, and that situation is so difficult because they were forced to work, and the uh, uh, wage is where it's half of the local uh, 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 wage. So it is very uh, difficult. But what what I say here, just say that how we are trying to do, for instance, the Lahu who are coming to Thailand and stay up the mountains. So what we are trying to help them, because uh, they don't have a titan of the, uh, of the uh, citizen, no? All that. So uh, to organize them to be united, it based on their belief. So we, we help them to build the, the chapel, we call that Hoye. Oh yeah, it's a chapel where they could to do a ritual together. And that is really help the people to come together and pray together and discuss together. So that kind of organizing through their religious belief. Hmm? Uh, then they have set up the network of the shaman so that they can confront with that. You know? So this kind of uh, how to bring the religious and culture to help them to organize through their belief. That is very important. And because of this tourism, the young, the young girl have gone to Pattaya, not to Bangkok, to all that. They go within 10 years, they come back. They get HIV. And more than 300 young, young girls die. And it hurts them a lot. So that is a very serious. No? Um, so I don't want to, to say. So this kind of solidarity that uh, SRS was really insists how to help the people to organize in order that to confront this migrant, not, not confront the migrant, but to be migrant, but to to, to come together to confront with the difficulties. Um, another uh, problem is about tourism. In Thailand, tourism is related with prostitution. Tourism related to the war, the American war with Vietnam, bring about a lot of soldiers. In 65 to 75, there were a lot of air base of the American, no? A lot of young women from the rural to the city. 
Uh, I was myself went to experience. I could not accept that reality that how human being do for this young girl. Uh, that what. Then after the Vietnam was finished, then the the police, uh, the, the the government declared policy of decades of tourism, as you say, uh, Tourism is promoted because they get a lot of money. Then, 20 years, 1975 to 85, the first uh, decade of tourism. And that, at the end of 85, 84, 85, then the aid start. No? You know, the government said, the church are trying to do something to promote to try to propaganda, not to, to distribute the fact. The government said, no, you cannot publish because it's a fact tourism. So it's 90, uh, 80, 85 to 95, it's spread full in Thailand. Yeah? And that is really a very important. So I think with this, uh, War, tourism, no HIV. It's come together. <laughs> this, so okay. To summarize, the church are trying to accompany men, uh, to empower people. That's what we are doing here in Thailand. How we organize? One most uh, very appreciated sister of Good Shepherd. She themselves, they themselves, went into Pattaya to work with the prostitutes there. When I saw them, oh, you, 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 how can they stay? Eh? And then from there, now 20 years ago, they have been really the mother of the prostitute. Accompaniment. They are not, as you say, tourism is there, a prostitute is there, but they do not condemn, no? They would like to be with them, accompany them, Help them, love them as it is, and it become a very witnessing to this kind of social teaching of the church, to be with the people, to be incarnated, to live with the what so called sinners. So it becomes a kind of we call it cross cross border, not just a, a traditions pastoral building church and all that, but it we goes out in order to be to live with that. So this is uh, the sense of solidarity that it took place. Then organize the group of the people, you know, to really help them to be human because when they, they meet with foreigners, they can, could be a human being in that kind of life. This, this is what is going to be. Now, um, the Lahu, about 250 villages, now they could come together so that they can deal with the government that they are human. They come to Thailand so that they could survive. So I think this, and then they are very clever. They go to the king and ask the king to do something for them. Otherwise the officer will exploit them. So this kind of things that happen. Uh, but it is difficult for the church to enter because they cannot do otherwise. They have to go with drug, you know, that golden triangle, a lot of drug. So very difficult, the, the church or other NGO even cannot, don't want to go because it's very dangerous. So this is a challenge of the church to really accompany them, organize them from their own perspective. So I think God loves them as they are, as as Father said. No, this is what happened in in the history of the migrants and uh, the the tourism and the women who are uh, becoming positive because of that uh, trend.